So hello everyone and welcome to our panel session on Inner Source and Ospos, Institutionalizing Open Source Culture Change. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you today on this very special day in Ireland. So hello from Dublin, Ireland and happy St. Patrick's Day. It's the reason that I'm afraid we can't be with you there live, me anyway, but, um, but we're still delighted to be here and now I will distract you for the entire session by wearing uh, special St. Patrick's Day poppers, but we'll, we'll, we'll go with that, we'll go with that and wishing you happy St. Patrick's Day. So my name I is... Feel, oh, go on, John. <laughs> I, I feel very excited that I also don't get my uh, special I know, we should have, we really Day should have bottles, coordinated that as a, at the get-go. It's okay. We'll we'll do. We'll, yeah, we'll, 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 yeah, absolutely. We'll improvise. But um, I just <laughs> we'll start today by doing a quick round of intros. So my name is Claire Dillon. I am the executive director in Inner Source Commons. I'm also one of the organizers in Ospo Plus Plus Network, which is a network for folks who are interested in creating open source program offices in the public sector and universities and governments and things like that. And I will pass it over, or in fact, down to John. John Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, yes, I am John Mark Walker. I run the open source program office at Fannie Mae, and I've been involved in open source things for over 20 years now. So, yay. <laughs> Great, Sorry. Let thank me, you, John Mark. Let me pass it down to the, on my screen, it's to the um, diagonal left. I'm going over to Isabel uh, Dross from. Hi, I'm Isabel. I'm open source strategist at Europace. Um, I'm also president of the Inner Source Commons, and I've been involved with open source, I believe, since I left university back in 2003, 2004, maybe. Um, went to become a member of the Apache Software Foundation, which essentially ta taught me how to do open source right. And I will pass it on to Anna. Thank you. Um, I'm Anna. I'm the uh, to do program manager. Uh, the OSPO program manager at Tudu, that it's an open group of organizations, uh, mostly based in the enterprise sector, that runs open source program offices or similar open source initiatives for the past 12 years now, I will say. And I've been involved in open source uh, from the last years. Uh, my mentors from my former company that was uh, Biteria, that is a software development analytics firm. And from there, I learned a lot of inner source, of open source program offices and open source metrics. And keep learning. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone. And, and thank you for joining us here today. We do have a fifth member of our panel, Tim Willoughby, who unfortunately couldn't be with us for this part, but we will be magically inserting his contribution at, at a later point in time. So he'll, he will be coming and joining our discussion later. Um, but for now, let's kick off with the first question of the day. And that is really why? Why inner source? Why inner source as a step on an open source journey. So would anyone like to take that first? Like we can, we can break up the flow here. So would anyone like to go first? I mean, I have lots of opinions, but you know. <laughs> go on, get started, John Mark. Let's, let's, let's hear why it is that all right. you see So first of all, yeah, I have, to, I have to talk about how I was very skeptical about the whole inner source thing, like when it first appeared from Tim O'Reilly's brain, I, I don't know some 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I thought it was bogus and unneeded because of course everyone's gonna be doing open source software. So why do we need this inner source thing? And then like over the years, I started actually working with, you know, uh, bigger companies that have to have these challenges around, you know, collaboration. They have challenges around modernization and they've been doing all these agile transformations and, and DevOps transformations. And they're discovering that you know, they don't have the ability to to easily collaborate with the external world. And so over the years, I've come around to the idea that inner source is actually essential to making the open source ecosystem work because in most of these companies, they simply don't have the process. Like they've been told their entire lives that open source is dangerous, open source is risky. Uh, and so they just don't have the, um, the processes and they don't have the clearance to be able to collaborate easily externally. And so a lot of it is comes down to how do we train and enable engineers to think like open source maintainers or contributors, but in an internal context. And I feel like once we break that barrier and, and get a bit more people uh, who are proficient at open source style collaboration, it becomes a much easier leap to go from that to uh, external contribution um, and even like maintainership and 
and launching new projects. Uh, it's it's really about building out that that set of tools and skills to, so that they're more comfortable in those environments. Brilliant, thank you, John Mark. And um, Isabel, you you obviously are very involved in InnerSource Commons as well. Are you seeing a similar set of trends in terms of you know the folks that you know of that have been implementing InnerSource formally through Osbos? So I see I see similar trends, but something that I I would like to take a step back actually. Um, when when I introduced myself, I told you that I came to Open Source like in 2003 and 2004. So that was for me very early. It was right out of university. So out of university, I learned how to do this asynchronous um, collaboration, like having everything transparent, having everything um, searchable. And back in the early 2000s, it also meant um, that you have continuous integration. You have very good test coverage, at least in the project where I started. So I came to my first employer and I saw people only on site. They were agile and stuff, but they didn't have continuous integration back then. Um, to me, that all of that felt very natural. So I've always been taking concepts from the open source world and bringing that into my own um, employer, into my own teams. And it really came down to a talk that I listened to at my very first Apache Con. I believe it was in, I don't know, 2000 and the eight maybe. It was from Bertrand de la Quetas on asynchronous collaboration and asynchronous decision making. And that was where it really clicked on me how valuable this could be inside an organization, in, inside a corporation. And I've started working in open source, but then in order to make a living, I always um, was working in non-open source companies. And what I realized is that there is a gap between those two work environments. In open source, very early on, we knew how to, how to submit patches. And I met senior engineers who didn't even know how to do a diff and how to create a patch and how to read it. So just a little story for that. Um, we had Berlin Buzzwords, which is a conference on big data in Berlin in one year. And we did a Hadoop hackathon after that. So we had a bunch of engineers in the room, maybe 10 people, starting from students up to senior engineers. And we did a quick um, poll of topics that people might want to work on. And then we decided that people only had time for one topic really. And they had to vote on which was the most important topic. And the most important topic really was for everyone to learn how to make a patch. So we went to the Apache Hadoop bug tracker and they had something like fix a Javadoc issue. So the first thing those engineers had to figure out is where do you get the source code? How do you check it out? Because it was a different system from what they were using at work. They had to figure out where to go for the uh, issue tracker and where to submit the patch because that also was different from the regular work environment. And that is why when I first heard about InnoSource and about the idea of InnoSource, it was totally obvious that for someone who grows up in open source, all, all of these things are very natural and very easy. But if you've grown up in, an, in a corporate environment, even the simplest and easiest things that we do on a daily basis, they are very hard. And if you are a student, senior engineer, even if you're a student coming out of university, it's very hard to ask those questions because you have to admit that you do not know that seemingly simple stuff. And you ha have to ask it in public and you have to ask it somewhere where it's archived and visible for everyone, including your boss and including your future boss. So this is, seems like a very low barrier. You can just go to a mailing list and ask, but at some point it amounts to a very high barrier. And that is why I believe that InnoSys can create a certain knowledge of how we work, a certain understanding of how we work, but also reducing this barrier of entry of asking all of these questions publicly because you can see internally how well that works. And that's why I believe InnoSource can be a first step towards open source. And that's also something that I observed at my employer where um, people started to understand several concepts in the InnoSource context, but then we're very, um, it was very easy for them to understand those same concepts in the open source world. Like we have several patterns phrased in inner source terms, but I found myself at the very beginning, I found myself often telling them, hey, that's how we do it in open source. But now 
a couple of years later, I see myself telling people, hey, that's how we do it in InnoSource. It's no different in open source. It's just public. And that's where it clicks with people. Interesting. That's that's amazing as well. And I think you're, you're you're dead right. And you know, to to add a little bit into that, you know, we, we did a, a survey with the Inner Source Commons community there recently, and it's interesting to me that actually there's a lot of folks that are interested in Inner Source, um, purely as this idea of how to make collaboration happen, which actually has this potential to bring even more people, um, ready to do open source, even if they weren't originally on that path to do open source. So it's not like a conscious decision to get ready. For First, but it actually brings them there, which is a potential to hit a hell of a lot more people, which is which is really, really great. So Anna, I'll come to you now. You're working with the to-do group. So you know a lot of people in Ospos. So what are your thoughts in terms of why they are looking at inner source or how what have you seen? Uh, so first of all, I totally agree with what Mark and Isabel said. Uh, indeed. I think uh, everything is around developer education and a lot of the earliest stage hospitals are focusing on that, on, on the legal side, but also on evangelizing the, um, the correct open source usage and how to inter uh, interact with open source. But all that it's about developer education on how to use open source. If you translate it to inner source, um, it has a lot of like, um, developer education, internal developer education. It's, it's a, a really big um, section within inner source. Maybe that's more for uh, how, to, um, how to integrate open collaboration within teams. But as, as um, Isabel was saying, translate it to, well, that's the same, but call it open source and start thinking about how to engage in open source and that's the the switch that um we we maybe some um teams can see right so um i've also seen um clara you were mentioning about the survey of inner source so at Tudor we have an ospo survey and uh, from the last year there was a question that asked about what is the main objective the main goal of your ospo and I don't remember if it was the first one or the second one uh, most um, uh, mentioned it that was uh, building an um, open source culture within the enterprise. So it was like, yeah, that's inner source. And that was um, also we, we developed like a, there is a model uh, out there from, a pre, uh, from the recent survey and a study we did uh, with other open source from office folks. Um, and there you can see like the different stages and if you take a look at it, you say like the basis of those stages, those maturity model is about educating developers. And also uh, when I interact in the community with the tutor community in uh, meetings and, and calls and, and, and so on, I always heard uh, how can we build policies to um, let developers, like my internal developers, learn about open source? And how can we teach developers? And are there any policies to teach developers? But everything is, first of all, within the organization. And then once you have all this, um, yeah, once you have evangelized this ecosystem of collaboration and open source, then yeah, then, then it's uh, time to move to um, outbound, like starting to contribute outbound, and then you think about open source. But um, also, there are a lot of organizations that, uh, in a public way, they are saying that they have an OSPO and an ISPO, or within the OSPO, they have an inner source because they are complementary at some part. So, as I said, totally agree. That's, yeah, I'm that's curious. Great. Oh, sorry, John Mark, go ahead. I have a follow up with for Anna. So, on that, on that survey, is there a trend as far as open source programs that are starting their are leading their inner source programs as well? Like, do you have data on that or has it been separate? Because open source programs initially, like there were the Googles, and I think some people tried too hard to be Google from the outset, not realizing that there were different challenges that companies have that, you know, aren't Google. Um, and I think that inner source, open source conjoining didn't really start to happen until recently. And I was wondering if your data, you know, showed that. So there is no specific question about that. 
Uh, we are working on the uh, 2022 survey, so probably that might be something to, to take into account or try to uh, create a question about that because it's, it's taking a lot of importance nowadays. Yeah, we, I bet. We'll, we'll definitely take that as an action. I, I'll add in that we did, um, as part of the survey as well from the Inner Source Commons, we did look at who was building formal programs. And, and I think there were over 40% of people, I think over 40% over of people had already got a formal program. And I think another 20% were planning to put one in place. And what we found is that for the vast majority of these formal programs, are, are being seated in an OSPO, or in fact are being officially called an ISPO, which is an inner source program office, but very typically quite aligned with an OSPO if it's already there. Similar skills. And Interesting. Yeah, and I just want to point out, I think, you know, the, the comment Anna made as well about the open source culture and in fact what, what Isabel had been talking about in the context of um, the kind of patterns and, and practices for, for what makes people effective. Like isn't, isn't that so wonderful because so many people you know, in my experience, anyway, when you're when you're certainly when you're introducing them to open source, they still think it's maybe just the license, right? I'm just going to make my code available, and that's it, right? That now yeah, now yeah. I'm doing open source. But to really make that effective at an organizational level, you have to have you know collaborative practices in place and people willing and able and ready and wanting to collaborate in that open way. And that's so hard. Like we're we're not designed to do that with our silos and our you know. Ownership cultures and things like that. So in, 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 in corporate organizations often. So there are there are system barriers in place that sometimes stop that. And then you see Ospos and inner source helping to break those down so that it, it puts people in a better place. Yeah, I, I did not appreciate the challenges that these teams face until I saw it firsthand. I had to experience the pain before I realized it wasn't as easy as well. <laughs> Just, you know, collaborate like they do in open source. What's so hard about that? Um, and the fact is, that, like most teams at internal, you know, organizations are not, they are totally siloed and their work streams are not planned the way that we're used to seeing in open source communities. They, um, they don't have autonomous teams that can do what they need to do. There are so many layers of uh, things that they'll need to request. And so it's, uh, it's not as simple as, you know, we'll just, you know, apply these principles internally and, and you're done. It's, there's a whole method of working. And unfortunately, a lot of these companies have also rolled out, you know, agile and DevOps programs, but they haven't quite gone far enough. And so what they've ended up doing is the agile implementations end up being essentially a reinforcement of their previous siloed operations. Uh, and DevOps basically amounts to, uh, well, let's, let's do some CI CD automated tooling, which is, is great. I mean, I, I totally advocating for that, but there's an additional organizational step that needs to be made that I feel like is just now coming to bear fruit because the, of the, the kind of inner sources emerge as kind of like the, um, the third leg of the, you know, transformation stool is the way I like to no, that's great. And, and so maybe maybe we'll build on that, John Mark. Um, so to think about, you know, OSPOs are typically this institutionalizing of open source. So they're, they're dealing actually, in my experience, with the two things of, you know, helping individuals and teams do it better in the organization. But they're also dealing with those systemic blockers you were talking about, like the organizational constraints and getting over compliance issues and, you know, regulation to some degree as well. So they're kind of playing both, both parts of, of that that game and um, so maybe we'll just go into you know what is it that an OSPO does you know in the context of inner source rollout like what what are we seeing their function in that journey being and um, so maybe Isabel maybe I'll come to you first for to, to get us kick started on that so, so it depends on which organization you start in mm -hmm. but some things that I've seen when working closely with engineers who don't have a lot of open source experience is, is that you first have to disentangle that there is a difference between using open source downstream, contributing to open source upstream and just publishing stuff as open source because yeah. if you go to an organization and to your engineer let's say think about when coming to them and telling them open source oh great I'm gonna publish stuff on github yeah, no. <laughs> How? What are the reason? What are the the criteria for choosing a certain technology? If the same, if there are two technologies fully pulling the same requirement, which criteria are you using to choose one open source pro, uh, project over the other? 
is it just tech reasons or do you also look at uh, stuff like governance at stuff like is there a single point of failure in the project etc so this is like the first step where you need to do some kind of education and and one would assume actually that the it, you know that oftentimes the kind of risk appetite and the the criteria for that choice may be different depending on the organization and even depending on the context of the code that's been used right so so it's probably yeah. the the OSPO is important in, in, in that path as well, right? In terms, and but also yes. for inner source code as well, in, in the same way, right? That that you're you're yep. you know so 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 all of this is very in organization dependent and contextual, I guess. I mean, we even have an inner source pattern pattern which is called um, explicit governance um, governance models, mm -hmm. where you where if you have an inner source project internally. You teach people that they should make it explicit whether they want to keep that project themselves or, and only make it available to others so that others can um, submit feature requests and bug reports like they were before. Or they, they can open it to pull requests, which means that they have to make time within their team to mentor pull requests that are coming in. Or they have a truly shared um, code um, code base between different organizations and teams within that corporation, which means that they also have to make roadmap planning and stuff publicly available within the organization for that project for everyone who participates. And if you think about it, that's the same things that you have in open source. And having that internally, like, like those three steps, helps engineers think about open source projects differently. They suddenly see the same patterns there where you have projects as that are foundation owned, projects that are owned by single entities, like single corporations, single vendors, or single individuals, or that you have the open source project, which is completely controlled, where you don't get a lot of help and where you just can submit a feature request if you want something changed. And some things that InnoSource can help as well is um, not only thinking about this um, downstream versus I publish something, but also thinking more about I unblock myself and instead of waiting for this feature request to be worked on, I submit a pull request myself. And that makes it easier to participate externally and it also starts teams off easier because what I've observed in agile teams that want to participate in open source is that they have a hard time um, scheduling and planning the work that they do on a patch or on a pull request. Because obviously the open source project is not in the same sprint as yourself and they are on a completely different schedule. And by using that same working model internally, it already helps to establish um, some best practices to deal with these interruptions. So, so just having the OSPO there to be able to to gather those best practices that are that are very specific to the organization, and then share them out in the education role that that Anna was talking about, which is some of it may be generic, but some of it may be again very specific to the culture and the context of the organization. Yeah. That's an important role. So, Anna, you mentioned you you covered education as being one of the important things as well before. And um, is there anything else that's emerging as you know in terms of what uh, an, an ISPO or, or an OSPO does with respect to, to inner source in your experience? Uh, well, in fact, when you were talking about this topic, I just realized that there is in the OSPO forum we have someone asked about this, like, hey, we are building internal policies on how to teach developers which projects they should be using. And there were a lot of uh, people that uh, started to say like, yeah, well, what we do at blah, blah, blah is this. But then another company says a different thing. And it's because as, as Isabel say, it's, it, uh, it's depending on um, the sector they come from, the culture they have and so on. But again, it's, it's great to see at least a place where uh, people can share experiences. So, and say, oh, this might fit for my uh, specific case. Uh, this this might not fit, and, and so on. Um, so I will say that this is uh, this is um, a challenge right now in in the OSPOVERS. I will say the, the exact exact same thing. 
Thanks, Anna. And how about you, John Mark? This, the, did that actually prompt any more thoughts? Yeah. On that stuff that you because that got me thinking about like, you know, cultural differences and the need for, you know, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, like not, you know, back in the day when open source first started, we were like, oh, well, it's all open. Everyone can contribute. Everyone's equal. Uh, except we realized, you know, later on that it became a way to um, uh, internalize and reproduce kind of like, you know, societal, uh, you know, um, issues around, you know, racism uh, and sexism uh, and that sort of thing. And so I'm curious when it comes to implementing these things internally, how are you addressing, you know, cultural differences depending on, you know, the, the backgrounds of the, the folks that you want to participate in the inner source? And I guess the, the main question is, you know, are you noticing that like, you know, certain, you know, it's easier for, uh, you know, a white man to participate as opposed to, you know, other people that you would want to, um, to be a part of it is, you know, how are you like uh, uh, adjusting for that? Because it's, it's something that, you know, because we're so new, we haven't really addressed, but I'm very keen to, to make sure that we're, um, you know, on the, on the right path there. I'm curious what the other panelists think. I'll, I'll come back to the other panelists, but I just want to add in that on my journey to, you know, around the open source and inner source ecosystems, one of the things that has been, I think, uh, a really great learning for me is the emphasis that both communities put on being very explicit about the principles behind codes of conduct, the principles of behavior mm -hmm. and the codes of conduct. That's not something that I've seen so explicitly defined before. Um, and, you know, knowing the great work that's happening in, for example, the chaos community in the open source world, where they're looking at how to, you know, uh, encourage diverse contributions and, and, and support that. Uh, and thinking about how the whole thing about inner source is to take those best practices and bring them to a much wider group of you know people within an organization i don't necessarily have the answers for you directly but um what i do know is that that practice that kind of ongoing practice of taking these great ideas and that that are that are have been born from um uh, you know the open source community where where anything goes right there's no there's no official compliance or regulation around you know these communities working together it's not like there's an organizational construct that somehow limits or constrains behavior so when you get it right there and then you bring it into an organization it can only be much more powerful in terms of adding on layers to what might already be there in a constrained organizational context and um, so I, I think that the kinds of guidelines that were, were described earlier in terms of, um, you know, how you contribute to a, to, a, to a project, how you make it clear, how you onboard into a project, how you make it welcoming and the kind of, like we, we have many patterns about thanking people and how, how you show gratitude. And um, these are things that make it a more welcoming experience for everyone to contribute outside their normal kind of, you know, scope of, of, of development per se, which I think can only lead to a more diverse and inclusive um, uh, kind of organizational general. But, I, but I'll pass it on. That's my own personal uh, beliefs on the matter. Anyone else got a, got a point of view on that DNI aspect? So I have uh, two, two to three points. Um, first of all, I think in open source, it's by it being very open and transparent, this helps um, spot issues where you have issues. Um, the other thing is also that there is a difference and there is a wide range um, of how these issues are being addressed or how they are see being seen, depending on which project you look at. So um, something that, that helped me a lot at my employer was to have a certain understanding where people would be welcome if they contributed and with that knowledge to guide people towards projects where they would be welcome as their first contributions and not being pushed back but i also see a certain cr uh, level of cross pollination so open source projects typically aren't in some they aren't in the white the people participating there each work at corporations. And what I see is that policies that you have in co corporations that work there somehow make their way into the open source project and the other way around. Mm -hmm. And I do, I do know that we do, do have challenges 
but I still have a hope, uh, especially when looking at something like chaos or at other initiatives, that at least we are addressing these issues. Thank you, Isabel. Anna, you were going to say. Yeah, I wanted to add that um, there is also um, certain roles uh, in open source communities and that I also think there exists an inner source that facilitates this, like tries to drive all this documentation, codes of conduct, that's how, those are, for instance, the DevRels, the developer relational, developer evangelist, well, and that depends on, on the organization you talk at, but uh, the, the DevRels in open source tries to facilitate and to welcome all these contributors. And I've, I've heard about internal DevRels, like people that are within inner source that are DevRels, but to facilitate this collaboration within their enterprise. So I've seen that, I think that investing in this kind of roles and positions is super helpful to, to achieve this. That's a really good point. Investing in the facilitators is a very good mm -hmm. tried and true method, really. Cool. Brilliant. Well, listen, folks, this has been an amazing conversation. We are unfortunately coming to the end of our bit. Um, it's always too short, um, but I'm very happy to remind everyone who's listening today that there's actually a follow-up talk with Anna um, happening tomorrow. That's uh, Friday the 18th, where she will be talking about demystifying OSPOs and what inner source can bring to emerging open source practices. So if you, if you haven't got enough inner source yet, you can come back again tomorrow and hear some more. And I will put in a, a plug for inner source commons that if anyone wants to learn more about it, please do come join us at innersourcecommons.org. Um, we would love to see you there and to help join in this conversation to bring it all forward. Uh, you'll find all of us there. So, um, so please, among uh, in other places as well, but, but I, I do hope that, that you will join us. Now, we will at this point go for a quick little session with um, Tim Willoughby to get his point of view. But um, from all our panelists in this part of the talk, I just want to say a huge thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, John Mark. It's been a great conversation. Um, and thank to all of the rest of you for listening here today. And once again, happy St. Patrick's Day. And thank so. you, Claire Dion, as well. Thank yes. you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Claire. See you all again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> of course. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. <laughs> Hello again. Here we have a bonus part of our panel session. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Tim Willoughby, uh, who's joining us here from Agartha Síochána, which is Ireland's police and security force. Um, I really wanted to get Tim's input to this because I know Tim is involved in some inner source. He couldn't be with us for the original panel recording, so we are using the magic of technology to insert him in after the fact. But Tim, give us a quick overview about your own experiences with inner source and what you've been up to. Yeah, thanks very much, Claire. And I suppose first is obviously happy St. Patrick's Day. Sorry we can't be with you on the day, but uh, for obvious reasons, we'll be uh, managing managing all of the security things around St. Patrick's Day in, my, in the organisation that I'm in. The rest of the country will be sitting back and relaxing, but I'm sure we'll be, uh, we'll be taking it the way most security and policing organisations take it. But yeah, the, the, the inner source thing is, I suppose, I've been on the... The whole open source journey since I think almost since I started in government in terms of as an engineer sharing code with other engineers on how to do drainage design or bridge design and moving that on from those early things it was all about openness and sharing and you know if I have a problem can I not just ask another one and you know the archives are all there to look at to share knowledge and I think where inner source is really becoming interesting is in the policing realm where a number of the the national police forces are starting to share code and what we've done is we've moved our end user computing or our mobile computing models to um i suppose a, a different architecture where we're we're basically architecting at at the lowest level or micro architecture and what that means is we're ruling out the language barriers and we're ruling out the different interface issues that we might have where we can share micro code so we have a, some code that can scan number plates or can scan licenses or passports or scan the the health codes that are where everyone's familiar now with the digital uh, COVID certs but we've scanner apps 
and we can swap those with other police forces without having to worry about the top layer or the user interface layer. So a number of us have moved to this microarchitecture in order that we can actually learn and leverage from each other. And I think it's 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 there's a code repository starting to build up. Like InnerSource has given you a way, the processes by which to do these collaborations, which is brilliant. And, you know, I completely understand that there are certain scenarios where security forces may not want to do that in completely in the open. So, so this is a way to do it between yourselves without, without being over, you know, completely open source. But when you think about it from a culture change perspective, was there a culture change element in that collaboration and how you all work together? I mean, apart from the technical outcome, was, did you find it a culture challenge? Oh yeah, I think I, I suppose I came I came at this from not having a policing background, and the first couple of sessions before we brought the developers in were really about the structure and how will this work. And my having worked with open source for years, my sense was just let's get them in a room and trust them; it'll work. And what's happened is other forces actually were looking at how they were doing their development and said, "Oh, never thought of this." And they brought more people over to learn about just about the simplicity of of being able to share beyond below the firewall. Maybe is that the best way to describe it in a policing world, rather than sharing in front of the firewall where the whole world can see. Yeah. You know, the people will assume we have stuff that can read passports and stuff, but they may not know exactly how it works. And uh, maybe those are things that we need to keep to ourselves. So, um, but it, it certainly. The more people saw what we were doing, the more people wanted to join and understand. And, and part of our discussion here today has been about how do you institutionalize those, that kind of culture change using something like an open source program office, some sort of um, some sort of institution that actually helps or smooths that journey. I mean, from your perspective, you have not been engaging or you don't have an OSPO or an open source program office or anything to no. help that journey. Do you think it would help? Like, would that be something that could actually ease that journey for future collaborations? Oh, I think I think absolutely to take the the learnings and to, I suppose, give a probably the governance and the to give the culture a sense of direction. That you know, I, I suppose without the governance, it just becomes a group of people who are fanatical. You know, so I think you need, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but you need somebody to actually uh, give it a direction and and have a focus. So. Others who want to join aren't talking to the fanatics, but they're talking to the realists about you know how how this will all work and and the commitments to join and and the benefits of getting stuff out of it. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you so much for sharing part of your journey. I do hope that uh, we do see some Ospos coming popping up in that space. We're seeing them pop up all over the place in in public sector organisations. So hopefully there will be one soon to help you on your journey. But thank you so much, Tim, for sharing your journey. And uh, once again, happy St Patrick's Day. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, happy St Patrick's Day. Bye bye. -bye now. Hi there. Welcome back. Uh, i just like to say on behalf of the, the Fosback Stage team, a real big thank you to all of the panellists. Um, it was a wonderful panel, very interesting. Um, we're very lucky to have two of the panellists um, with us here today. So um, please write your questions in the chat um, uh, for you to ask them. So I would just like to welcome uh, Isabel and Anna. Hi there. Um, so yes, now we have some time for questions, uh, probably about uh, 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes. Um, looking in the questions now, we have a, a, a couple of them. Um, so the first one is, um, someone says, hello, thanks for your talk. Uh, more often we deal with inner source and OSPOs as a taxation and transfer pricing issue. Do you see broad awareness for this or a chance to address this within the broader inner source community? Just wondered what your thoughts on that are. So one thought that I have with respect to transfer pricing, <clears throat> transfer pricing is that there is an ongoing discussion on that topic. Just yesterday, we had a community call in the inner source comments. Um, it will be public or it should already be public on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. So you may want to uh, watch this talk. In addition, we do have these discussions in the inner source Slack where um, you can join them. 
Okay. Um, and there's a question I think that was relating to um, something that you said, Isabel, earlier about um, pull requests. So it says, when a pull request comes in, uh, is the assumption that the uh, pull request sender might need mentoring to get started with in the source? Is that something that you see? It's yeah. not so much that they need mentoring to start with InnoSys, but it may be that they need um, support and help with understanding the architecture of the project that they are contributing to. It's no different than when you start your first, your very first pull request with an open source project. You may need to educate the, the person on how the process works, but you also need to make time to explain to them the general architecture or to point them to the correct documentation or to like beginner stock docs, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, Anna, you were talking about um, education there in that talk, and I just wanted um, to get your thoughts on it. What are um, some of the most um, innovative or interesting examples of this kind of education that you've seen? I wonder if you could um, share with us some of the things that you're, uh, yeah, you're interested in or think it is good that's out there. Uh, so are you talking about specific policies or documentations that uh, organizations are doing to uh, educate developers? Um, I didn't really have anything specific in mind. I just uh, wanted to get your like views on, um, okay. so for example, for people who are thinking about getting involved in this kind of stuff, like what could they look at, for examples, or yeah. mm, okay. So there, are, um, I, I think GitHub has a, a really useful guide for uh, individual contributions. Um, I can share the link later and. Uh, in Tudor, we have uh, guides for open source program offices. So in GitHub has a guide for individual contributors. So if someone that uh, is a developer or maybe is not a developer and they just want to get started to how open source work, like how to submit my first pull request and how do Git branches work, because that is something that uh, maybe some developers like goes crazy with that. So that is something that, um, GitHub has great stuff. And also there are uh, some devrels uh, in the ecosystems that uh, serves, that has channels, like YouTube channel, like learning by doing. And, and um, I honestly uh, learn a lot from YouTube, to, uh, um, YouTube videos and, and this kind of documentation, like for the very, very first, um, like how to get started. And I will say that that's, uh, good resources to at least get started. Also, the one of the good things of the OSPOs is that OSPOs are creating in for uh, their developers and other um, OSPOs uh, these specific um, guides, like uh, maybe more tailored for their needs and for the OSPO, but it's in the public and uh, it explains everything. Like for instance, uh, Yahoo, Mm -hmm. uh, has a OSPO webpage and they have like a complete guide not only about educating developers in the community but also in the legal side like what are CLAs how do they work uh, what are uh, software bill of materials because that is also really important and I know all the OSPOs mature OSPOs that already has also these guides so that's great because it's in the open and all the OSPOs can learn from them mm -hmm. Great. Um, Isabel, do you have anything, um, any thoughts on this kind of uh, yeah, education or getting people involved in this way? Um, first of all, I would like to say that I agree with everything that was said so far. And in addition, a lot of the bigger open source projects, they also have mentoring programs where you can get into um, open source contributions. There are formal mentoring programs like Google Summer of Code or like outreachy things. But there are also informal mentoring. If you go to a mailing list, say at Apache, and you say, I have no experience, please explain to me how that works, then people will be very helpful. And typically, the larger ones or the older ones, they also have pre existing documentation, like how do I make, make my first patch? Where do I find the source code? And how does patch submission work? So typically, you will find that on on some web page, which is for contributors. Mm 